All right, if you are in grade school, um, Aubrey is going to take you guys for a time of study and some fun stuff and a snack, so just follow her. She's going to head right out those doors in the back. <laughs> All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I am... Oh, that... Can't, I can't tell you how much that warms my heart, Michael. It's sarcasm at its finest. <laughs> and for someone who likes sarcasm, I, I take it as a, a blessing, I guess. Um, but I, I just want to say, I, I look out at your faces, um, and I see people that I just genuinely love. Uh, people that I care for, people that I pray for, um, and it is just a blessing to be here with you guys. I know that many of you do the same for me, and I appreciate those prayers. Um, if you're comfortable, um, I just ask that you extend your hands out, um, and the reason for that is just to allow just a visual of surrendering what it is that you're holding on to um, so that you can trade that for what God has for you. And um, let's just commit this time to him. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we don't want to rush through what you have for us. We don't want to stand in the way of what you have for us. And Lord, you know um, all that has come our way. You know the things that we have yet to face and the things we're in the middle of. And Lord, we just hand these things to you, knowing that you are more than able to do what you do with them. And I pray in this moment, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would just fill this place, that it would fill each and every person, that the words spoken are your words, but Lord, that your peace would fill this space, that your peace would fill each body, each heart, and that our trust would be 100% in your promises and in your goodness. And we thank you for what you are going to do. We thank you for what you are doing. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, every act of obedience and surrender on our part is building this foundation of trust that we are going to be able to stand on, not only in the everyday of our lives, but also in the times when we might be wondering, hey, God, what are you up to? Because I just don't get it. In John 18, 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Everything that Jesus did here was with eternity in mind. He said to the Pharisees who questioned him, hey, when is the kingdom of God ever going to come? In Luke 17, he said, the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, oh, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Do we look at each day truly with the knowledge of that? Are we taking time to soak in the word of God? Are we taking time to get to know him more? And as believers, do we function with the conviction that the kingdom of God is within us? I think it's natural human tendency to want to be seen, to want to be recognized, to want to be built up by other people. But the truth is, it is the innermost part of us, that hidden piece of us, that reveals the true power and purpose that we have. And I think the question that we have to ask ourselves is how big of that piece do we want? Because that is in our control. Is the piece that we have tiny and obscure, maybe only drawn upon in moments of desperation where we feel like, oh, I've got nothing else to do but to pray. But we kind of have to weed through ourselves first to find that piece? 
Or is that peace growing? Is it igniting into this all-consuming flame? Because I think the time that we spend when we are intentional in wanting to grow in our knowledge of Christ, that time, it can seem impractical. It can seem like nothing significant is really happening. Um, I had somebody who uh, took the step of fasting, and they fasted for three days. And when it was done, they were like, I don't know. I just don't think anything happened. I was hungry. I was really grouchy. And I kind of went off on people on Friday. (laughs) And I'm like, you know what? That's okay. That's okay. You surrendered a part of yourself, and God did work in you in those times. You just might not see it right now. Because we want the significant things to just knock us off our feet. We take a step, and we want like a mountain. But the mountain just might be more like, you know, an iceberg for a moment. It just hasn't risen up to the surface. That time we spend with God that time we spend soaking in God is going to enable us to remain steadfast. And we need to soak so we don't snap. See, God is in the business of using people to reach people, right? We talked about this last week. So if God is in the business of reaching us through other people, it would be in our advantage to stay limber, to stay flexible, to stay ready. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And if that sounds familiar, it's because we talked about that last week. But something that we also need to hold close to our hearts is the reality that it isn't always going to be easy. And that might be because of something on our end, or maybe it's something on the receiver's end. We aren't always going to do everything right, and people don't always love what we have to say. But if we are ready when the door opens, when God prompts us and that door opens, and we speak with gentleness and we speak with respect, Peter continues in verse 16, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. That sounds like a pretty solid trade-off. When we act out of obedience to Christ, God takes care of the rest. Now today we're studying through chapter 23. And this is an awesome chapter. It really is because it highlights how God perfectly puts all things together in his time. And God can use things that happened years prior, and he can combine them with something that's happening in real time, and he can orchestrate everything for that perfect thing that he has in that moment. And we think that we can do that, maybe not on that scale, but we think that we can maintain some control over our lives. That is until we see how God does it, and when we bear witness to how God does it over and over again, it makes a whole lot of sense why he would want us to surrender our little flame of effort for his bonfire of success. And we've said this before, but the word for God working behind the scenes is providence, right? He works behind the scenes to accomplish his purpose. And God is doing that all of the time. And this is a really good reminder for us in light of the chapter that we're reading today because chapter 23, it is this historical narrative. More specifically, it is a narrative of how God's providence worked in Paul's life, perfectly positioning him through his obedience to get the gospel from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. This is a task that if God had told Paul on that road to Damascus when he was in utter blindness that he was going to do, Paul would have been like, you're crazy. But through all of the years that God was working in Paul's life and in everybody else's life, this is possible because of God. 
See, the work of God is all over this chapter. And he may not be fully visible by name, but we should be very familiar with this concept. Because there is an entire book of the Bible completely devoted to God's providence. Do you guys remember which one it is? Esther. Yes, the book of Esther. And we spent a wonderful amount of time in that book. Remember, we saw normal, everyday things taking place in a kingdom. All the while, behind the scenes, God was revealing himself as the mastermind of it all. And there is a difference between God's providence and a miracle of God. When God works miraculously, he intercepts the natural world, he supersedes the natural law with his own law. So walking on water, that's a miracle. A dead person beginning to breathe again, that's a miracle. But when God moves in providence, is it's different. Things are happening naturally. People are doing things normally. And God is working behind the scenes, taking those natural events, and he's turning them into one amazing real people, real Jesus moment after another where his will is being revealed through the natural world. We like a miracle, right? And we pray for miracles, and we should absolutely pray for miracles. Yet if God works through the everyday experiences of our lives, it would make sense then that we should also be on the lookout for his providence. But see, when we're on the lookout for providence, we have to exercise the P word. And that P word is patience. And it kind of makes my stomach a little when I hear that word, because that is a tough thing to exercise. But God isn't going to reveal things until the time is right. So while we wait, we have to trust. Because when the pieces do all fall into place in what's going to seem like just another normal day, we are going to be able to recognize it for what it is. And in those moments, I imagine just the coolest wink from heaven where God's like, I got you. I see you. That is how much I love you. Now, Job, we know his story. He is a guy who suffered greatly. There were very, very dark times in Job's life where he tried to find God. He tried to make sense of everything that was going on in his life. And he says, I go forward and I can't find God. I go backward and I can't perceive God. But then he said, but he knows the way I take. And when I'm tested, I will come forth as gold. Essentially, I can't find God, but that's okay. God knows where I'm at. I don't know what he's up to, but he sure knows what I'm up to. And Job rested in that fact that God knew him. And Paul, he finds himself in a very similar set of circumstances today. Now, as we saw over the past couple of weeks, when he arrived in Jerusalem, everything and everyone was against him. There's another riot that breaks out in another temple. He's almost murdered again. He gets arrested again. And on the way to the barracks, he shares his testimony. The people listened until he uttered the no-no word. And what was the no-no word? It was Gentile. And then another riot breaks out. The commander, he's confused. He's like, why are people so mad at this guy? Let's flog him to figure it out. Paul's like, um, no, I'm a Roman citizen. Hands off. The commander removes his chains. He's free for a moment. And then he sends him to the Sanhedrin. And the last verse that we looked at last week said this, Acts 22, verse 30. The next day, since the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Now, this trial that Paul is facing, it's a little bit different than the other trials in the book of Acts that we've seen. It's different than when Jesus stood before this same group of people. 
Whenever the council convened, they had their own meeting hall. And it wasn't far from the Antonia Fortress where Paul is. It was on the Temple Mount, but it was on the other side. It was a separate space. But because two riots have broken out over what people perceive the problems to be with Paul, the commander of the Roman Tribune, or the Chiliarch, he wants to maintain order by having the Sanhedrin come to where Paul is rather than have Paul go to them because another riot just might break out if people see this guy. So this is pretty big-time stuff. And we can see just how big within just the few nanoseconds of Paul's trial. So let's take a look. Verse 1 of chapter 23. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and he said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. So, It's not getting off to a great start for Paul. He utters just literally one sentence, and he's slapped in the face. Now, the high priest, Ananias, he is the high priest in Jerusalem, and he served in this position from 47 AD until the first Jewish revolt, and that ended in 70 AD. But what also happened in 70 AD was the Romans came into Jerusalem and they destroyed the city and they burned the temple to the ground. And what's interesting is when the Romans come in, it wasn't the Romans who killed Ananias. The Jews killed Ananias because he represented them, but they despised him. He was horribly corrupt. He was known for cruelty. He was known for violence. Um, Josephus, we have talked about him from time to time. He's a great historian of this time period. He said that Ananias was so corrupt that he used to take the tithes that were meant for the ordinary, everyday priests, and he would take them for himself. And if anybody tried to get in his way, they were beat or they were killed. He was also known to then use that money to bribe the Romans and bribe the wealthy Jews. So he was just a stand-up guy. So after being slapped in the face, here's Paul's response, verse 3. Then Paul said to them, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. I love the word moxie, so anytime I can use it, I'm going to use it, and I'm just going to say Paul had moxie. Now, in the area, or the era, I should say, of farmhouse-style decor that we're living in, we might think that whitewashed was a compliment. Oh no, whitewashed was a metaphor for a hypocrite. So in the book of Matthew, Jesus has just returned to Jerusalem. It is the week prior to his crucifixion, and he spent so much of his time teaching people in that last week. And he's speaking to the crowds, and in some of his teaching, he shares what is described as the seven woes. And those woes are outlined in Matthew 23. And one of them is specifically directed toward the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. This is what Jesus says in verse 27. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So Paul is hitting back really hard. He's just using words rather than his hands. Verse 4, those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. There are so many commentaries on Paul's response. I didn't realize he was the high priest. And these commentaries, they range from genuine sincerity. Since this wasn't an ordinary trial, they maybe weren't wearing their identifying robes. 
Paul also hadn't seen these men in a very long time. And Paul was also believed to have poor eyesight. This is something that is found in um, the book of Galatians if you want to check it out. Um, But some people think that Paul was being a bit of a sassy pants. Like, I wouldn't have imagined you as the high priest sort of deal. It's always how you say it, right? Did your mom ever say it's not what you say, it's how you say it? Where is the emphasis in that sentence? I wouldn't have imagined you as the high priest. And it's possible it was one of those things. It could have been all of those things. But as soon as they come at Paul, he makes it right. After uttering those words in his own way, he publicly apologizes. He's like, you're wrong. I'm right. Or, I'm wrong. You're right. (laughs) I think that's how we want to apologize. (laughs) Maybe that's a Freudian slip. He says, I am wrong. You are right. So there's humility in that. But Paul is also a very bright guy. He is very well studied. We talked about this last week. And he is standing in front of the Sanhedrin. And as he's standing there, he's perceiving a few things. Remember, he himself was a Pharisee. He is a descendant of a Pharisee from his father. And some believe that he was at one time also part of the Sanhedrin. And let's be honest, he has to know After everything he has been through, he's probably not going to get a fair trial. So he takes his past experiences, along with his present set of circumstances, mixed in with some solid wisdom, and he makes his next move. Verse 6. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee. I am descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits. But the Pharisees believe all these things. Paul knows the tension between these two groups. And he is making use of that in this situation. See, the the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were the two main groups within Judaism in the New Testament. And they developed not in the Old Testament, but actually between the Testaments after the exile, after those 70 years. So when Israel was taken captive in Babylon for seven decades, they leave Jerusalem. They're on foreign soil. And back in Jerusalem, what's happening at the same time is their temple is completely burned to the ground. And what this means is that there can be no sacrifices made. If there isn't a temple, priests can't do what priests do. So you have Jewish people who who are in exile, and they're wondering, how are we going to honor God if we can't atone for our sins? So they resort to studying the law in these little groups, and these little groups will go on to be called synagogues, places where they would study and apply the law of Moses when they couldn't practice ceremonial law as they once did. And after the 70 years, when they returned home to Jerusalem, these two groups develop. And the Pharisees, they were the people who were saying, hey, <laughs> that exile, that was, that was bad. That was bad. But we kind of got what was coming to us. We never want that to happen again. So we're going to start obeying God. And they made it their aim to practice every bit of the law. And clearly those practices eventually become their religion, right? They take it too far. But at the same time, this group, the Sadducees form. They were the the rationalists. They were more liberal. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the resurrection, in angels. They didn't believe even in the Old Testament. They only believed in the books of Moses. So they're a true counterpart to the Pharisees. So when Paul says, I'm a Pharisee, the Pharisees are like, yeah. When he says, I believe in the resurrection, they're like, yeah. And this dispute starts, and they start fighting among themselves. And for a brief moment, the focus is off of Paul. You've got these two religious groups fighting each other. 
I just want to say, thankfully, we don't see that today, right? Not at all. And they're arguing among themselves, and the tension is rising. It's getting super hot again. Verse 10 says, The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring them into the barracks. So back in prison, Paul goes. And Paul is there through that night, he's there through the next day, and he's there into the following night. And I can only imagine that Paul is getting tired, that he's getting discouraged. Do you wonder if he ever had any second thoughts? Did he ever replay those voices of the people who told him not to go to Jerusalem? Maybe he's beating himself up like, I'm so stubborn. I'm so hard-hearted. Did I wrestle with the Holy Spirit or did I wrestle with myself in this, right? I mean, we do that. We do that all the time. We can know something and we can know that we know something and we do it until, <laughs> and there's that word again, until, until maybe things don't go the way that we thought until maybe we're more uncomfortable than we'd like to be, until maybe we're just tired of the fight. But look what happens when Paul is at the end of his rope. He experiences an until that is pretty awesome. I imagine Paul laying on the cold, hard ground, just wondering where God is. Verse 11. Then the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Now we can read that and just think about that as just, you know, a verse. The Lord stood near Paul. But what would you do if you were laying in a prison cell and the literal Lord stood near you? and said, take courage. I mean, that's a game changer. That is a purpose restore. That is supernatural energy delivered. Because the Lord had promised Paul he was going to Rome. That is where he wanted to go. And even though his current circumstances were completely hard to comprehend how he was going to get there, such complicated situation he's in, God is still with him. He's still leading the charge. And if God said he's going to go to Rome, to Rome he's going to go. And it is so easy for us to look at someone else's life and wonder why they might do some of the things that they do. We all do this. And I am just going to say, don't pretend that you don't. It would be so easy to look at where Paul is at in another prison cell, having nearly lost his life a few times since coming back to Jerusalem, and think, man, you clearly misunderstood God. I hate to say it, Paul, but this one's on you, right? But the reality is, our opinion, it doesn't matter. I find it interesting with us as humans because we feel so entitled to our opinions. And so much of what we do is rooted in our opinions. Yet if our opinion isn't rooted in Christ, it's that temporary fluff that we talked about last week. We should be each other's biggest cheerleaders. We should be each other's prayer warriors. Because if what is happening wasn't for us, our opinion is irrelevant. Think about this. What Paul did, big picture, it was for us because it was for the kingdom of God. But little picture, this was God's providence for Paul, the path chosen for Paul. And we need to be so careful to not stand in the way of other people's little picture moments. 
because those little providential moments are part of God's kingdom. And that's why we can't get caught up in what other people think of us when we are following after God's call in our lives. People can be great, but they can also be whitewashed walls. We all can. That's why we have to stay tethered to Christ. We have to stay glued to his side through prayer and through his word. Because when we abide in him and we allow his word to abide in us, where he places us doesn't really matter. Because our trust is in the one who sovereignly engineers our circumstances. That is the sweetest spot of life, no matter what that spot looks like. And what happens from this point in the chapter all the way to the end, it is the making of a fantastic movie, except it's real life. So let's take a look, verse 12. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot, they went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. Now this is one of those ridiculous oaths that Jesus said never make. He said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't swear by heaven or by earth. Just be an honest person. And what's really silly about this whole thing is that they aren't going to be able to do it. Did they really starve themselves to death? I doubt it. And I think it's a pretty good reminder for us not to say boastful things that we can't actually accomplish. So once again, you've got this group of Jews who want Paul dead, but then something crazy happens. Verse 16. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell them. So he took him to the commander the centurion said, Paul the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, what is it you want to tell me? He said, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They're ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with his warning, don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. So first of all, Paul had a sister. Paul had a nephew. And that nephew was just waiting around in the courtroom. Talk about God's providence. He just happened to be there. Interestingly enough, this is the only insight that we have into Paul's family, other than the fact that his dad was a Pharisee. He had family. Does it also strike you as odd that Paul, a prisoner, would be able to call out to the centurions and tell them to do something for him? I mean, it seems a little strange. But the thing is, if you were a Roman citizen, you had certain privileges should you find yourself arrested. Number one, you couldn't be accused of a capital crime unless there were a lot of witnesses. You couldn't be flogged, as we saw last week. And you could also appeal your case to Caesar directly in Rome, which Paul is going to do. And you could summon certain Roman officials to do certain tasks which Paul has just done. And this is how Claudius Lysias responds. He writes a letter to the governor of Caesarea, where Paul was determined to go and stand trial, 
The governor's name was Felix, and in the letter, he essentially says, look, I'm not sure what to make of this guy, but I can't find a charge against him that deserves death, that even deserves imprisonment. So when I heard that there was a plot against his life, I wanted to send him to you right away. And Paul, he is taken to Caesarea in the coolest way ever. It is outlined in verse 23. Get this. He travels with this posse of dudes. There are 200 soldiers. There are 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. 470 guys accompany him on his journey. Do you think God wanted to get him there? Do you think anything is going to stand between God and his purpose and will? No. And then they travel in the dark of night before the ambush could take place the next day. I do want to know how long those guys went without eating when they heard that Paul was gone. Did they die? I doubt it. We're weak as humans. When Paul arrives in Caesarea, this is what happens. Verse 34. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Now what's interesting about Felix is he was once a slave. Claudius Lysias actually released him. And because his brother, Felix's brother, happened to be in good standing with the emperor, he gets him this job in a place that no one wanted to be. So he's got this like hoity-toity title, but nobody wanted to be where Felix was. So we have this slave who is now a governor. He succeeded Pontius Pilate. And one of the Roman historians said of Felix that he had the power of a king, but the spirit of a slave. He was brutal. He was horrible. He was mean. And it's this common theme that we seem to be seeing among the leadership that Paul is facing. But because Felix succeeded Pontius Pilate, he knew about the crucifixion. He knew that happened. He knew stories about the resurrection. He knew the gospel was spreading around the territory. And he couldn't help but wonder, what are these Christians all about? And now Felix has Paul. And he is going to send for Paul to get information about the gospel. Do you think Paul is going to be a good witness? Considering how God works? Considering Paul's obedience to Christ? Absolutely. Because that's how God's providence works. He is going to be the best witness for Christ in this moment of time. And we are going to see that in the next couple of chapters. In all that Paul walks through, Jesus was with him. He met him in one of his darkest hours and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. Those weren't just feel-good words. Those were words from Jesus. Be of good cheer, Paul. You're doing the right thing. I am with you, and I am going to lead you to the very end. And I think what the Lord is saying to us today is, I am with you. Whatever happened this week, whatever happened this month, whatever is going on in your life, whatever you're finding yourself coming out of or going into, he is your rock. He is your defense. Whatever you're struggling with, I pray that we would hear the Lord say, I am here. I am providentially guiding you and directing you. None of this is by accident. Cheer up. Wait for it. See what I'm going to do. Paul has had quite a life. He has been on three trials in two years. He has been a prisoner several times. He's been in chains several times. And now he is going to stay a prisoner for the rest of his life. He will be momentarily released only to be rearrested. He will ta be taken before Nero. And he will be decapitated on a road outside of Rome. 
we like a good ending. The ending where the hero rides off into the sunset after conquering unimaginable obstacles. So Paul's ending might seem like a bit of a disappointment because we'd like to see Paul freed. Now that would be a good ending, right? But the reality is it was God's will that Paul stay a prisoner the rest of his life. He had work for Paul to do, and that work just happened to include some chains. Paul is secure in that because he knows he's not the hero of the story. And in the end, he has all of eternity to ride off into the sunset with Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are constantly working on our behalf. You know our weaknesses. You know our struggles. You know that we say things all the time that we can't hold up our end of the bargain to. But God, you have never done that. You have never said something that you haven't meant. You have never said something that you have not or will not fulfill. And Lord, we thank you that you are so patient. We thank you that you come to us in our darkest hour and say, I'm with you. I've got you. I know this is hard. But the story's not over yet. There's more to come. And Lord, as we come before the table this morning, as we partake in the bread and in the wine, as we partake in these beautiful symbols that represent the greatest sacrifice of all time, Lord, we work again to surrender the things that we just have itchy fingers to pick back up. We work again to surrender the lies that Satan would like nothing more for us to believe that we're a loser, we're a failure, we're no good. Nothing great's ever going to come out of you. Those are lies from the pit of hell. You are not a God of confusion. You are our biggest cheerleader. And you are fighting for us with every circumstance that you put in our path. That we would turn to you and turn away from ourselves. Lord, thank you. Thank you that we can remember and that we can walk with you in this thing called life. Until we are with you in eternity. When you are ready, please feel free to come forward. Dave and Joanne are going to administer the elements.